with me. <clears throat> this meeting is being recorded. Um, so let's let's make a start, and then uh, hopefully the other speakers will join as well. So a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, this month we are covering uh, an incredibly important topic uh, related to uh, crypto, uh, and that is. Uh, how to establish uh, truths and facts in a world that is uh, full of misinformation, half-truths, fake news, and clickbaits. Uh, our motto and mission as an organization uh, is, is advancing evidence-based adoption of blockchain and crypto assets. And this, this topic is very relevant to the work that we do at the association. So when we announced this forum, I was in Portugal that time uh, presenting the UK's blockchain roadmap. And quite a few people came to me asking uh, to, to organize a full day conference on this topic. So it's, it's, it's quite important um, topic of discussion. And in my role as, as a BBA president, I regularly meet with policymakers and regulators and, and blockchain and crypto executives. And they are always asking, uh, how do we uh, ensure that the information that is available uh, on the internet is reliable, trustworthy, uh, and credible? Because, because we uh, are using that information all the time to make the decisions, the important decisions. So I see media outlets as a very vital, vital trust bridge between the uh, original event and the news that we received. And they have a very vital role to play in the crypto ecosystem. So um, I welcome you all, uh, and thank you to Adam and and Egli. I look forward to an, an, an informative uh, session. And uh, these sessions are recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. Uh, I hand over to Egli now uh, to commence the session, and I'll just sit back and listen to the discussion. Thank you. Hello and thank you, uh, Dr. Nassim, for having me today. Um, it's an absolute pleasure joining uh, such an interesting panel um, of professionals. Um, my name is Egli and I'm, I'm an affiliate with the British Blockchain Association. Um, I work in Cyprus in a Cyprus London-based company called Delecti. Uh, I am an analyst and I consult on various projects and R&D projects that involve blockchain and digital transformation. Uh, we will start this forum with a brief summarization of the BBA ecosystem, and then we will be moving on to our discussion of ethics and crypto journalism. Um, now, as you may know, the BBA publishes the first open access blockchain research journal, the JBBS. Um, it's available in print and online. Um, the editorial board comes from 71 countries, including 11 states in America. Um, and the British uh, Blockchain Association is the only nonprofit association that has a center for evidence-based practice on distributed ledger technologies. And the research journals come in print copies. Uh, they're available in 300 plus universities uh, globally and have been cited from the European Commission and UK Parliament, um, as well as from the Office of the Secretary General, the, o the OECD and the SEC. Uh, the British uh, Blockchain Association Forum uh, holds 51 blockchain associations from 42 countries across six continents. And all of the above uh, impressive statistics can be found on the BBA website, as well as on LinkedIn. And um, now we will be moving on to our agenda. Why are ethics, uh, why ethics matter? Why is it important to establish facts and truth in the noisy crypto world of news and, and clickbaits? Um, so let's start the discussion. Um, could, could you please um, introduce yourself, uh, Adam? Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Adam McCarthy. So I'm a, Adam Morgan McCarthy. I'm a reporter with The Block. Um, I've been at The Block now about a month. Before that, I was working with Business Insider and covering crypto markets as well, but also more general markets and uh, financial markets. Oil, from oil to 
lumber prices to crypto as well. And before that, I was working freelance with being crypto. So it's also an online crypto uh, publication covering breaking news and um, freelance. Uh, so kind of from time to time, but also doing the odd feature there and um, really kind of getting to grips with journalism. That was kind of my first role. Um, I also work in a Web3 startup uh, in London, Zaf. So uh, they're kind of focused on the retail investor, tracking portfolio and sharing uh, investment knowledge and kind of community, community-based investing. Um, so that was my role there. But uh, for the block for the last month, and I'm covering markets there. Perfect. Um, now let, let's start with, with the first uh, question. Um, now, wh- why is there so much, uh, let's say, noise and misinformation and, and fake news in, in the world of crypto? Yeah, I think um, because a lot of crypto lives online, lives in kind of forums and chat rooms and Reddits and Twitters, it, it can be susceptible to that. But I also think because I've covered it, financial markets now for a little while and track them since I was maybe five or six years kind of keeping up to date with everything it's also kind of I've noticed quite common around also this kind of retail investing since it's boomed that whole area has become noisy not it's not unique to crypto I don't think I mean I was reading on Twitter yesterday there's someone has like half a million followers was comparing um the VIX volatility with like you know 1989 crash or something I think it was but VIX was only invented in 1990 only kind of like started being used in 1993 this person has 500,000 followers and they give retail investing advice and that's that's you know the world of fan that's the world of equities and that's not so it's not unique to crypto but um I think definitely in crypto because it's, it's such a kind of nascent space and there's new technology kind of being born out every week or every day like a week in crypto feels like a month so there's definitely space for people to come in and kind of have a great idea or maybe not have the right framework to build that idea out but they because they get the because uh, it's happening so quickly and everyone wants to be on the next boom that then they're getting that uh face time they're getting that air time that they might not get in other spaces where there's more traditional kind of uh steps and measures in place so I think it kind of comes with the territory, but I guess we're coming into maybe 13 years now or so of Bitcoin. So it's it's slowly growing out of that. And I think we definitely try at the block to kind of vet everything we do. And because we have research and data, if there ever is a question, you know, you just want to clarify something you're writing, we can kind of, there's a, there's a kind of divide between the research and the journalism. But if you want to clarify something you might not know, it's how you have that resource. So for us, that's one way that we kind of manage that understand um yes uh, i agree with you and um now let's say uh, how does someone who is relatively new to crypto establishes the accuracy of news he sees online yeah um it's a good question i think they have to definitely I think the first thing, if you want to get new to crypto, and maybe the first thing I'd say is read. Um, I know we kind of, you've mentioned that you might ask what the first bit of advice would be for somebody who wants to get into crypto. But I think before establishing what news is, is re- verifiable or worthwhile, I think read, just read everything about crypto, understand the space in general, and then you can kind of sense test things yourself. Um, find, I think Twitter lists are great. Find several people that you can verify as you know, trustworthy. Um, the, you know, the people that have kind of maybe gone out there, if they've made mistakes before in the past, you can see that they've owned up to it. Or, you know, Mike Novogratz came out during the week, I think, and he made, you know, he kind of owned up that it was a good lesson for him. And I think he had a Luna tattoo that he has on his shoulder. And he was saying it will be a, a it'll kind of stand to him forever as a, as a kind of testament to how tough it is uh, to invest. And I think it's good to see that kind of humility. So if you're going to read yeah. people or follow kind of prominent voices, because um, it's good to follow prominent voices and obviously they're very useful if they've got a great track record but especially ones that show humility um, then I'd say you know obviously trusting the platinum press might not be as um, up to, uh, that might not be as quick to kind of cover a lot of things in crypto so there's a few outlets I think we ourselves cover certain things really well and we kind of want to be that verifiable source um, so yeah I think finding prominent voices and finding people you can trust and then an outlet you can trust that's uh, 
shows that same sort of kind of humility and um, uh, accuracy in some reporting. Definitely. Um, certainly not everything we read on Reddit is accurate. And um, yeah, uh, when it comes to... Yeah, I mean, you can... So, yeah, I mean, you can sense out some of those things as well. If you see something that seems too good to be true on Reddit, then it, you know, it probably is if you're not seeing it reported other places. So I guess okay. that's, um, you can kind of cross, cross examine things that way. Definitely. And um, let's say, how do we establish uh, some ethics um, or professional codes of conduct uh, to ensure information coming out of crypto media outlets is credible? Uh, and you know, reliable and verifiable. Yeah, I, I I saw this question. I was kind of looking forward to the other panelists as well because I I'm quite I'm quite new to journalism. I've only really been covering things for a year, but I guess you know the sourcing has to be there. Um, you have to have certain like certain channels that you trust and go to. Um, if I'm looking at things and I'm seeing that there's a lot of YouTube videos about this and it's pushing it out, I'm I'm kind of wary so i guess we need it it's still so still so new that those kind of channels that you can verify those sort verifiable sources are going to take a while um code to conduct i guess you know it's hard to say right now what what, what what's needed um i'd say i think maybe i'd leave that to other people to, to say i wouldn't um i wouldn't I'd be enough of an authority myself to say on that i think i just want to maybe make a, a small comment that when you read something online, you read an article or a blog, and it, it mentions about uh, some organization or some article or some event. And if you can, if it is possible for you to go and check the original source, then always do that. Um, and you, you, you will find this information quite, quite easily these days uh, on internet. So if there is a, a comment or an opinion about an event or somebody something said at an event, then see if you can actually find from the original source what was actually said or what was actually written um, and then, and then cross-check. I think this is very important. Many people just look at the, the headlines or the, 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 the click and the, they don't actually dig deep into what was said at the original source. So if it is possible for you, then do that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree. I think if you can cross-reference things and, and uh, dig a little deeper, it comes back to kind of making sure you're just reading and consuming as much as you can because the space is moving so quickly. You need to just keep up with it. You need to be reading a lot. And then I, I guess it comes with the territory after a while. If you're doing that for, for, enough, for long enough, then you can kind of spot... Um, you know, you can spot things that like if it talks like a duck, walks like a duck, then you can kind of say quickly enough what it is. Can I just uh, add um, in in um, traditional journalism? There's, um, I mean, it, it, really, it really depends on which what the purpose of your using the information is for. So there are kind of it, there are two competing things here. One is you've got to pass information on. Uh, the, the, the the classic is three reliable sources so um <clears throat> you know in, in in traditional journalism you'd say okay find something on the bbc find it, if you're in england find it on the bbc find it on the ft find it on reuters on the news wires then pass that information on because you've verified that those are tr traditional regulated sources um you, you know you, you can be sure that thing has happened if you're going to expand on that information then obviously go to the original source but you don't necessarily have to go to the original source if three other major news outlets have the story um, but that, that's if you're passing information on. If you're if you're using information to, to buy and sell, for example, there's the old adage, um, buy on the rumor, sell on the fact. So <laughs> uh, it really depends on, you know, it, it depends what you, the purpose of your, if you're using the information is. Um, and of course, if you're buying on the rumor, <clears throat> you need to dig out the fact. And as, as Nassim was saying, you need to, to verify the source pretty quickly before you you know, if it's, a, if it's a rumor, you need to verify at least that it is a rumor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Okay, we can move uh, to our next question. Um, also, um, 
yeah, when it when it comes to ethics, it's it's a very uh, thin line. Also depends uh, the countries and the journalism behind uh, each nation as well, and um, and and what codes of conduct uh, each country you know allows to journalists publish. Uh, specifically, let's say countries like you know China, Russia. Um, I think there's a very thin line uh, there. Um, no, okay. Um, let's say um, how how do we devise evidence-based reporting standards to ensure policymakers and regulators receive the most trusted information to make policy decisions? Hello? There is a slight delay, I think, I believe, with, with, with Adam. So that we just give him a few seconds. Yeah. Can you? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, OK, great. So. Okay. I got disconnected. Yeah, I think he was he was having some some connection issues. Um, my thoughts on this are that uh, any information that we see or hear on on the internet, um, we have to we have to make sure that if we are making important decisions, we check the accuracy and and reliability of of that information. And in in academic uh, literature, we have levels of evidence. Not all evidence is, is equal. Uh, some evidence is of good quality and reliable. Some evidence is not so good quality and, and, and not very reliable. So the quality of, of our life, the quality of our business, the quality of anything that we do in the world depends on, on, on how reliable the information is. And there are, um, there are various ways you could establish um, the, the reliability and also the quality of information. So for, for academic sciences, we have a peer review, which is uh, an independent ex external evaluation of the work. So for example, if you publish something in a, in a good quality scientific journal, they won't just publish your work. They will send your work to, uh, to external reviewers. These are the experts in the field. And, and most of the time they are volunteers. In fact, almost always they are just volunteers who uh, give their uh, precious time just for the betterment of, of science, for the advancement of good quality uh, evidence. And they basically review your work. And if you have made some claims in your paper, which are not factual, if you have made some extravagant claims or some uh, statements that are that cannot be verified or 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 not true, then they will highlight it, and and they will uh, send the their suggestions, their feedback back to the editor. And <clears throat> having some uh, some objections, some criticism does not mean that your your paper or your work is going to be rejected. It just means that it needs to be improved. Yes, sometimes there is paper that are just completely bogus and they are beyond repair stage. So we recently received a paper at a journal and it was basically just a proposal for a research. It was not a research paper. Uh, some students saying, I want to do this and this. So that's not research. It was just a proposal for, for research and, and we rejected the paper. But on most occasions, uh, the, uh, the paper is reviewed and then you have to, so for example, if you made some statements and you, you have not cited any uh, research papers to back your claims, then the editor is going to ask you, you know, to please provide some more evidence. And then you can review the paper and resubmit it uh, with the suggestions. So um, a, a revise and submit decision or a rejection decision uh, is always, is almost always going to improve the quality of your, um, your work. 
uh, and then you resubmit your work and then if it is acceptable it is published so this is a, a quality control quality assurance mechanism some check and balance there it does not mean that the paper is completely free from errors because all of us are humans reviewers also um, but at least they will try to ensure that the work that is going to be published is relatively free relatively free not completely free but relatively free of any major errors any major omissions relatively free of bias uh, and also a conflict of interest i think is an important one um, have they declared all the conflict of interest uh, funding etc um, so when this work is then published then you have uh, what we call peer reviewed research and multiple research studies on one particular topic then gives us this opportunity to then combine the result of those uh, studies and then make some recommendations and when you do that you may have seen our evidence based blockchain the triangle chart thing i'm sure we have been sharing it for for, for a while now and on the top of that is meta analysis and systematic reviews and what meta analysis and systematic reviews are is more than one research paper on a particular topic so for example if you want to know uh, what's happening with the use of blockchain in healthcare there are many papers there are hundreds of papers that have been published on the use of blockchain for healthcare and now it's time to look at how we can benefit from those individual studies increase their what we call power by combining the results from multiple studies on one particular topic and then um, use it to make our uh, our work uh, our patient care better for example so you look at uh, are there any meta analysis and systematic reviews and if you go on google today and type systematic review healthcare blockchain for example you will find certain uh, some studies actually um they have done the systematic reviews and we have got some recommendations similarly there are some meta analysis done on consensus mechanisms in blockchain uh, etc so on the top of the quality of evidence when we talk about the highest level of evidence what the uh, policy makers decision makers regulators are more interested in this is the um, this is the type of evidence that they are interested in there was um, a few years back they looked at 10 uh, community programs in the united states and together the 10 programs were costing more than 10 billion dollars 10 billion dollars not million 10 billion and they evaluated those community programs and they found out that the nine out of those 10 programs were not based on any scientific evidence they were not evaluated at all and or partially evaluated but they were not serving the purpose and how did they establish that the programs were not working by conducting what we call a randomized control study and this is important so randomized control study is a type of study that we do in science in science when you compare two groups so let's say in a case of blockchain we say the first group has blockchain enabled uh whatever it is and then the second group is the legacy system and then you compare the two groups and see how the programs how the project is doing and and then you come to a a, a conclusion so this is called an rct a randomized control study and they did the randomized control studies and they found out that nine out of 10 programs were not evaluated at all or partially evaluated and they were not serving the purpose which then led to the government of united states pass this bill uh, that we should be making more evidence based and policy based um, decisions because we are not doing that and we are bleeding money and a lot of money billions of dollars is is a lot of money which then led to the then president of united states donald trump sign um, evidence based policy making act and you can go and read about it tonight evidence based policy making act which is now passed as a law it is now a law in the united states to make evidence based 
policy decisions. It's a law in the United States. And, and the background, as I told you, is, is quite interesting. They looked at the, the community programs. So when it, turns, when it comes to uh, quality of evidence, you have your uh, randomized control studies, your meta-analysis, your systematic reviews. If you don't have that, so for example, blockchain is a, is a relatively new, new discipline. New compared to other disciplines, if, for example, you compare it with, with astrophysics or zoology or botany, it is relatively new. Um, but we do have uh, good clusters of studies now coming out, and, and it's time to do some, some systematic reviews and meta-analysis. But if you don't have that, then, then just look at the individual research studies. And again, not all research studies are equal. Uh, you have to make sure that they are good quality. Are they peer reviewed? Are they published in a reputable journal? And so on. And then as you move down the, the, the hierarchy of evidence, you have, um, as, as Brian and Adam were saying, uh, you have your uh, essays, your an analytical reviews, uh, your opinion articles, and so on. But, um, but those are weaker evidence because my opinion is just my opinion about something. Um, and if my opinion is not based on uh, scientific research, on scientific evidence, then at the end of the day, it's just my opinion versus your opinion. So um, this, this is exactly why in science, expert opinion sits lower down uh, on, the, on the hierarchy of evidence. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is kind of in a nutshell how you establish the, the, the quality of evidence. You always try to start from higher up and see what uh, what level of evidence I have. So try to start from the top. But if you can't find the evidence, then you can go to the bottom and and see if there are other reliable and credible sources of evidence available. So this was my uh, my two cents on 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 establishing evidence. Yes, uh, definitely, absolutely. Um, also, researchers uh, propose uh, certain frameworks when it comes to publishing reports in crypto. Let's say um, the research methods used uh, or having awareness of the ethics and the guidelines um, when it comes to um, media and social media. And um, practical frameworks are certainly needed. Um, to cover discussions, uh, the ethical impacts of the adoption of cryptocurrencies. And um, um, yes, uh, so... Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you, you're right. So we, 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 we get a lot of information. We are bombarded with information every day. You go to Twitter, go to LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, we, we receive a lot of information in the crypto world. Uh, from the news sources, and 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 sometimes it is good quality, sometimes it is not so good quality. So it, at the end of the day, if you are a C-suite executive, if you are a senior decision maker or policy maker or a regulator or a government officer, you you have to look at very carefully and analyze the information, uh, as Brian was saying, uh, to to establish uh, the facts, and because you don't want to be making decisions based on and information that is not accurate. So uh, you have to slow down a bit uh, and, and see what, uh, what are the facts here. Sometimes it is not very difficult to establish. Sometimes it's not easy. Um, as I said earlier, there is this uh, news and media outlets are the bridge. They're the trust bridge between an event or something that has happened and then the, the receivers, the us, the readers. And they play an incredibly important role in, in transferring this information, in conveying this information from the source to the receiver. And, uh, and they have an incredibly important role to play. Um, so uh, so I, I think it's very, very important. As you said, there is a lot of misinformation. Um, th there's no doubt about that. And, and, and this is why it is very, very important at, at an individual level. Everybody is responsible. I think the accountability lies on the shoulders of, of everyone. Um, to to establish that the uh, that the information that we are receiving is true and accurate. Yes, uh, absolutely, and it's, it's important uh, to address uh, the lack of disclosures by a lot of journalists, a lot of media, and there is a potentially 
a very serious uh, breach of journalist uh, journalistic ethics, uh, especially from high profile mainstream medias. Um, let's say when it comes to uh, cryptocurrency exchanges or let's say Bitcoin and all these trending uh, hashtags, um, it's very it's very important to um, make sure we have the accurate information. Um, now, if you, if you look at um, not many people know, but I, I, I'll share a very interesting fact. The we are celebrating Bitcoin's Pizza Day today, the twenty twenty second of uh, of May, twelve years ago. Uh, somebody bought two pizzas for for ten thousand bitcoins. Um, <laughs> we we talk about Satoshi. Uh, as an anonymous, anonymous person, person or persons, but uh, not many people know that the white paper, the paper that he published, um, he cited eight references at the end of his paper. Paper is, is in public domain. If you have not read it, I would recommend you read. Um, he cited ten, eight references, which means he based his paper on, the, on those eight references. Okay, he could have cited more, uh, but he felt that for the purpose of Bitcoin paper, those eight references are the most important. Now, interestingly, if you go to those references and read, you realize that five out of those eight references are peer reviewed scientific papers, peer reviewed scientific papers, and three of those five are conference proceedings from academic symposia. Okay, so he cited eight references, Satoshi, five are peer reviewed scientific papers, and three are from academic conferences. What this tells us is that even Satoshi, whoever he or she or they was, were from the right from the very start, um, they were building the foundations of Bitcoin on, on peer reviewed academic, good quality scientific evidence. He could have cited an opinion article. He could have cited a blog, um, but uh, but but they didn't. So for, so what that tells us is that um, when you are building, as as Newton, Sir Isaac Newton said, standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I was able to see far because I was able to stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, you you build your work on on quality evidence, whether you are writing a research paper or, or writing a white paper, uh, very important to uh, build your work on good quality evidence. Uh, yes, of course. Um, also, um, there's a lot of big media and also corporations that, you know, that they've been often, often accused for working for the maximum uh, viewership. Um, also, uh, when it comes to politics um, decisions and governmental influence in crypto, um, usually and most often, um, big media follows maximum viewership standards. And a, a lot of uh, the news are inaccurate. Um, so again, it's very important to establish a framework um, and, and address also, it's important to address this behavior. Um, uh, now, um, yes, that's right. And, and and I would like to add that um, there is there is a lot of lot of blockchain is still uh, what we call unsettled science, and what what we need is high quality research to make decisions and high quality information on what's working and what's not working. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Somebody, somebody shared recently. I came across this post of critical thinking crisis. Uh, I would uh, completely agree with that. I think we are, we are facing a a critical thinking crisis globally. And and this is um, there is there is hype. There's no doubt. Uh, but there is always some hype around innovative technologies. And this is uh, this is almost always a feature, not a bug, because what happens is. You have these inflated expectations, attract resources, the talent, and this this helps to build, uh, you know, through the trough stage, and then you move on to enlightenment and productivity. 
are following a short period of disillusionment and uh, but 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 no doubt there is a there is a critical thinking uh, crisis uh, globally the information that we see uh, we sometimes do not uh, evaluate it carefully we are not in, um, very good at critically appraising the information and i've said this many times before decentralization does not mean that there is lack of accountability it it means that accountability um, now lies on the shoulders of every individual in the ecosystem and when we talk about self sovereignty it's a great privilege uh, but it comes at a price of great responsibility and all of us have a very important role to play in this ecosystem all of us uh, whether we are academics whether we are in public services enterprises academia we have all of us have an important role to play uh, self accountability is extremely important in decentralized systems yes i agree and um, now let's say do you have any suggestions um, tips or advice to newcomers that wish to take up to crypto reporting um, as a full time profession um yes i think um, follow the footsteps of people who are doing um credible work um learn from people who have uh, uh established themselves as credible and reliable as as adam was saying earlier uh in the field of uh, journalism this is a this is still uh, again if when it comes to blockchain crypto journalism is a relatively new area um but i think journalists have an extremely important role to play here um uh, adam has some connection issues but he he would have been better to throw some light uh, on this but uh, my my opinion on this is that uh, follow the follow the footsteps of people who have already established themselves as as reliable and credible journalists uh, see how they present information see how they establish information um and how they present it both in writing and and also verbally uh, and follow uh, follow their footsteps that that would be my advice thank you dr nasim so um I'm not sure is um is adam um will he be joining for yeah i think he was having some connection issues maybe we can conclude the session what what i want to say in the end is that the things are moving at a, at a very very fast pace and we we need to have um uh, realistic expectations of uh, of the technology and and blockchain and crypto my personal opinion is ref has reframed the role of uh, of of governments and the social contract between between uh, governments and policy makers and citizens and it's all about organizational change and new ways of thinking and journalists have, are going to play an extremely important role uh, in how we receive information and how we analyze and process it so um we can i think conclude the session uh, by thanking all those who joined uh, and also to adam and um, next our next uh, forum is going to be next month uh, more information will be shared uh, on our social media channels and uh, and via the the newsletter of course thank you thank, thank you everyone thank you very much and we'll be tuning next month right take care bye bye thank, thank you, you. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.